Turn on. We ready? Ready? On. Welcome to the October Planning Environment Committee for 2020. And um, when we start, we always pay our respects to the traditional owners of this country, uh, the Gubby Gubby or Kabi Kabi, and thank them for looking after this place for many millennia. And we pay respects to the traditional owners, past, present, and emerging. So the first item on the agenda is an update to infrastructure charges resolution, as this is probably the first re first report about infrastructure charges. It might be worthwhile for look just to give a potted history about what infrastructures are and why we have to do resolution such as this. Um, okay, basically, well, infrastructure charging is basically where development makes a contribution towards council. Um, for the infrastructure that council provides, which is needed to serve development. Um, it's been an ongoing, changing um, uh, legislative field since, two, I think, 98, since IPA came in, and um, where the original uh, contributions at that time were PSPs. IPA then brought in an ICP, which we were the only one to have a coastal major road network infrastructure charges plan. That then um, got uh, updated, or the new form, the adopted infrastructure charges came into play in 2011. And um, that's been evolving as well, um, slight tweaks by the state. And um, that's the process we, we're in at the moment. Basically, a development, um, if it increases development on a site, it's adding demand onto council's network and pays the, the contribution. Uh, this report, there is no change to the actual, um, no, no physical change in the charges to what we are actually issuing today. Um, just that it, it's uh, already, these rates are now just updating to the current regulation. Um, stipulated maximum charge rate so it's easier to explain to uh, um, uh, customers that uh, how the indexation works so just just with maximum in maximum charge yeah. rates some years ago the state government yeah, decreed that yeah. um, mm -hmm. infrastructure charges may be an in inhibitory factor in development approvals and made their decision that we couldn't charge over a certain limit regardless of how much we estimate it actually costs is that that's about. right, yeah. The charges don't reflect the actual cost of infrastructure. They are well below the actual cost um, based on the original PIPs and the IC uh, infrastructure charges schedules, they called them then, with the PIPs. Um, they were meant to um, reflect the true cost, but when the state got all everyone's uh, schedules in, they uh, they didn't like them, they said it was too high, and, um, and so they've come up with the adopted charges for a shame. Um, out, the, the, the state sets the maximum charge the council can um, issue. Um, because we're, uh, Unity Water looks after the water and sewage, we have a, an agreement with Unity Water on the percentage which is theirs, um, it's called a break up agreement, and that's in the resolution as well, and none of that's change for you. So what's the current state cap? What's the cap that they've put on there? Uh, for a three bedroom dwelling, it's uh, around 30,000. Um, uh, yeah, oh, what was it? 100? Oh, it varies. Exactly. It's, it's yeah. in the table. 32, 32 yeah. 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 Thanks. Do we have any other queries? Oh, I've got a question. Oh, um, just in, in light of COVID, do we have any um, latitude with the payment of this? Or? Yes, yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we've been doing that. We've yeah. got something like um, nearly 30 odd um, uh, deferrals yeah. and also staged payments. Yeah. Most of the staged payment agreements uh, are for smaller developments that they've done, <laughs> and that's they won't make their next payment till 1st of July or, or June 2021, and then six, six months after that, and then another six months after that. Other developments um, are, you know, if they apply for it, they can automatically um, uh, get their uh, charge extended or payment extended to um, uh, the 1st of uh, July 2021. So and that's, that, that is a council uh, 
policy that we did. Yeah, yeah so right. we've deferred payment of them up until yeah. the 1st of July um, with no interest yeah. charges. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And some have paid, I mean, because um, the bigger developments generally don't like doing it because they want to sell off the property and part of the deal is that it has to be paid prior to any sale of the property as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay. Same question, I've been asked. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, I just have there? a question around, I don't, like I need all of this, um, so just bear with me. In terms of the trunk infrastructure and roads, are these fees and levies applied only at the stage of application or is it ongoing? On approval. Once on there's approval. a development approval has been issued, yep. that triggers assessment and issue of the infrastructure charge, if it applies. Yep. Um, and it only gets paid um, when the development's completed or any time earlier if the applicant or developer decides to. Mm -hmm. um, and it's indexed to the time of, of payment. Mm. And does that charge apply when the business has been sold? No. no. No, it's when the development, it's, it's a development, not a business, yeah. it's a development once the approval has been completed and acted on. So, so let me just talk through how the process would work. So I'm going to do a four lot subdivision. Yep. So I'm going to divide a block of land into four. Mm -hmm. I make an application. I get approval. So now it's given me approval subject to various conditions about mm -hmm. whatever it might be. What happens next? Um, we then issue an infrastructure charge with that approval. Yeah. Um, and the calculation is based on the four new, the total four lots mm -hmm. less the existing lot as a credit. So existing development, whatever's on the site, it's lawful that has um, a credit uh, okay. applied to it. And that's in the resolution, that's uh, yeah. the floor. So when I come to get my plan of subdivision signed and sealed by council, to lodge it in the title's office, yeah. to get those lots created, that's when I yeah. normally have to pay my, um, I still call it headworks, show my agent, yeah. but my infrastructure charges yeah. Yeah. Um, in yeah. terms of that process, which goes towards the impact of of new properties on the network. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a one-off payment. So it's, it's not, yeah. paid it's, it's not yeah. every okay. year, it's a one-off. Yeah. <clears throat> and it, the money collected has to go be spent on or accounted for by spending on the trunk infrastructure, yeah. which okay. is in our legit. And that's why, you know, depending on as the legit changes, we just have to keep the um, resolution, um, which is what we did with the new planning scheme, mm -hmm. that some parts of the uh, uh, of, of council's area so they didn't didn't have any stormwater infrastructure. Yeah. So that's why we didn't charge, you know, we exclude stormwater for those areas. Mm -hmm. the, the theory behind it is that if the me as a developer who are doing those four lots didn't pay that amount mm -hmm. and someone else did four lots and someone else did four lots and that cumulative impact would mean that an intersection would need to be upgraded because there'd be more traffic or that there'd be higher demand on stormwater in that area because mm -hmm. there's more subdivision or more yeah. development feeding into that. If the contribution wasn't being made as each development occurred, then all the other ratepayers would have to pay for that at some stage. Yeah. So it's about paying your way in terms of what impact are you having on the on the network mm. and paying your contribution towards that. Um, and said if we did do this, then what would happen is all the other <coughs> ratepayers would be effectively mm. subsidising that development by having to pay for that upgrade yeah. intersection or pay for the upgrade mm. of that stormwater in mm. that locality at some stage in the future. That's the theory that sits behind it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just one other thing on, on your point about referrals. A lot of other councils are very, they were very nervous about getting deferrals on developments, especially lot reconfigurations. So we're one of the few that give any, any development the opportunity to have it deferred at, at the current time. Right. Thank you. Just one final thing, we've mentioned stormwater roads, the other a bit of truck infrastructure, well, yeah, the parkland. There's, and there's, three, there's, there's, th there's five networks, water and sewerage, that's Unity Waters, and that's where the percentage goes, you know, they then issue their own infrastructure charges plan, or ch charges notice. Um, our networks are classed as transport, which in our legit has the trunk roads, the trunk pathways, and the, the uh, trunk uh, public transport, which is bus stops. Um, and um, and any uh, terminal transport terminal that we, that we decide to put in. Um, the other network then is stormwater, with, and that can be either um, uh, quality and quantity um, measures. 
And the final and just explain that, what that means it's not only just the pipes, it might be a, a treatment system like mm -hmm. a detention basin yep. or whatever it might be. Yeah. Yep. And um, then the final networks is uh, public parks and land only for um, community um, infrastructure, community land, they call it. And that's only the land component for that. We can't actually put the library, the value of the library in the legit, but the land that it sits on is included. Mm -hmm. But the, any parks, normal sports parks and recreational parks, that's all defined in the, in the legit, and that's uh, cost of you know, land and, um, and the works. So at the other end of the sausage machine, Karen, when we get to the capital works program, we'll look at each year, we'll have a list of projects in there, and if any of them are, are fall under the um, legit, um, mm -hmm. it might be a trunk infrastructure, we can actually use some of the money to be effectively hold in trust towards that type of project. Yeah. And so we can say, oh, well, you know, spend $200,000 we've collected through our infrastructure charges towards that road upgrade intersection. Mm -hmm. if, it's a, if it's a trunk or identified in the program, we might have to use other ratepayers' funding or loan funding or whatever I need to pay the balance. Yeah. It never, what we collect doesn't always pay for all the trunk infrastructure, but it goes towards it. Mm -hmm. I, th I think our um, value of, of uh, charges will cover maybe 20%. Mm -hmm. Uh, of the cost mm -hmm. of the future projects, um, yeah, and also now there's a mandatory. Um, we have to report um, annually on what we collect, what we spend it on, mm -hmm. and also what um, developers have been given offsets. Um, so you know that's all on our website already, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think Trent's working on the on the actual list of council projects that were trunk. Just explain what an offset is. An offset is when we make when we condition the developer to build a piece of infrastructure, and if that infrastructure is trunk, um, like we could be upgrading the, the pathway, is is the most common one, mm. um, and therefore we deduct the cost of that path off the charge. Mm -hmm. And the actual infrastructure charges notice that gets issued is fully detailed, has the full calculation. And details of any offsets and lots of other information as well. Okay. Would someone like to move the motion? Moved to Councillor Stewart, seconded Councillor Tom. All in favour? Right, unanimously. You can move on to. Thank you. Um, the second item, which is material change of use 20 of uh, 20027 and a uh, reconfiguration of a lot to go with it. In the material change of use, commercial business type 2, medical, involving building work associated with relocation of a building in a heritage character area and reconfiguring of a lot, four lots into two, at 45 to 47A Maple Street and Mile 9 Mile Street, Peroy. Now, this one has been requested to go to the General Committee, but have we got queries or issues that we'd like to? Staff to address um, so any questions. Or, meeting. Yeah, any questions or further information you might need? Um, what is the the name the balance site? What, why is it called the balance site? Um, it, if it's possible to go to a plan to show it, um, I think it's on page thirty three of the report, Cassie. Yeah, page thirty three. Thank you. Sir. Um, so there's a essentially there's a number of deaths one there's a number of lots that form part of this application mm -hmm. um, but the reconfiguration seeks to uh, amalgamate those lots down to two lots yeah and and one lot is being called the subject site which is where the medical facility to go used to go and the balance lot is the second lot essentially so there's an existing building on that lot and that building is to remain it's just where the boundaries located is to be changed um, so if you were to look at potentially um, in the report back to page 14 mm -hmm. um, there's an aerial photograph of yeah. the the location right. and that if i could maybe just yeah. so as you'll see on this picture here there's um, one two three four lots associated mm -hmm. with the application um, the reconfiguration component would as i said bring that down to two lots yeah a boundary coming approximately through here, right. the balance lot, and then the subject site being where the medical facilities to be located. Yeah. So will the house okay. and the balance lot stay there? That's correct. Is it all owned by the same person? Yes. Right, okay. 
So why would they? Is that why would they keep that house there? Is, is it required to? There's no requirement for them to do that. Um, it's, it's, it's uh, I suppose in, in their regard, they, they keep an asset, I would yep. presume, they keep another lot for potential future development. Okay. Um, when you say tandem parking, if you said that there's a problem because um, there's, there's four, there is required 44 car parks, and there are 44 car parks, but some of those are tandem car parks, and so they don't really fit. That's right, so the, on this same page, if we just to scroll down, you'll see the car parking arrangement. Um, so a number of uses within the scheme, it, it does talk about uh, car parking rates that need to be provided and then allows, for example, two to be provided in, car, in tandem. Generally the number's quite low. For this use it doesn't contemplate that. Notwithstanding, we would consider some, you know, maybe consider some tandem, yeah. but in, in, in this circumstance I think there's, <coughs> I think it's 12 that 12. are provided in, in tandem and it just creates some practical and logistical issues with potentially people getting locked in. So a tandem one means that a car pulls in in front and then another car parks behind it. That's yeah. correct. So again, put that <coughs> to the picture, you'll see that this arrangement of the car parking through this area here is essentially in tandem. There's a turning bay here, so there's just two on their own, but they've yeah. got a car park, car park, car park, car park. So there's one, yeah. one gets locked in essentially. Yeah. But if that was staff, that wouldn't really be a problem potentially, would it? it, it it's. There's potential for staff car parking. You know, we would look at it for a tandem arrangement to, mm. to be suitable. In this instance, they haven't been able to qualify or quantify the, the number of practitioners are going to be on site and the number of staff. Mm -hmm. 12 is, is quite high, I would consider, um, because you'd have staff, they're not necessarily going to work the same hours, not going to work at the same premise. They may, you know, in, there's been a number of tenancies in this building, so there, there may not be a relationship between who parks in front and who parks behind. That might be in part of another business. People may want to come and go during the day um, for lunchtime or for meetings or the, or the like, or doctor's appointments or whatever it might be. Yeah, so typically we would support some tandem mm. arrangements with staff, but this is, we think, is excessive and not practical. Um, radiology, did I read it? Well, one of the issues is radiology, um, and across the road at the Eden Hospital, they've got, they have the radiology unit which from what I understand is pretty old. It's been there for a long time. I go there, I've been there a zillion times. Anyway, um, is that, I heard that, that, that the lease on that radiology site might be, might be coming up soon or that, that that radiology may not be there on the other side of the street in the next couple of years. Is that in the report? Um, no, oh, there was a submission that raised um, some potential tenancy issues with the Eden Hospital and that they may be forced to relocate. I'm, I'm not privy to any lease agreements or uh, I'm not aware of the ins and outs of that, I suppose. Um, that, that may be the case, but that doesn't preclude if they were to have to leave that site that there wouldn't be other locations within the existing buildings within the township that they could not use yeah. as well. Mm. I'll make a question. Um, <clears throat> A developer for medical purposes on this site that retain the existing character building, would there still be um, a spare land area where a standalone annex for X ray could be built? Now, I noticed that one mention of a garage being perhaps not the best. Yeah, aware. it's a substantial size site. Um, the structural report does make recommendations that the building can be relocated and, and reused as a as a dwelling, um, so it has habitable capacities in its current form and it's structurally sound to do so. So be, with this, the um, extent of the site area, I would consider that's reasonable that the building could be relocated and, and an, a new building annex onto the back of it to accommodate some medical uses. But without the moving of it, there's like a, there's no ability to just put a small thing at the moment. I suppose we don't, we don't have to solve the design solution, I'm just thinking that well, it's, it's that, located. That to me to be the obvious solution. If, if the, that could the main be reason that they, they were arguing in terms of the structural adequacy was that the floor wasn't sustainable for the the access the bulk for the X ray and all that sort of stuff. So, mm. yeah. yeah, I mean, if you look look at page fourteen, which shows the aerials, there's quite a large area of, of space around the building where yes, they could could do that without relocating the building. How hard is it to to relocate that building? 
if you know you're saying, or you're saying just even moving it around to put an X-ray um, facility onto it, moving that the original, the old structure there, like a scale of one to ten, or how hard is it for you? Are you thinking to move that? Well, I can only base my comments on the structural report that was provided um, yeah. with the application, and the structural report does identify that the, the building is sound yeah. Yeah, to, so to be it. relocated off the site completely, yeah. and then for it to be used again as a dwelling. Yeah, I think if you look at that aerial, sorry, Kathy, we'll just go back to it. It does show quite a bit of space around the existing house, so in my mind it wouldn't need to be relocated mm. if they wish to build a you know, special radiology in a separate building. Yeah. Just looking at that back here, probably a better yeah. place with me. Yeah, so quite large. I'm going to go out on a limb here, you guys, because that the house that's on the balance site is talk about a talk about a, a structure that does not fit into Kuroi. That is probably the premier structure house when you drive up in front of that. It doesn't fit. It has no heritage qualities whatsoever. Where the the house uh, in question does have those. Is there any way you could tear down the house on Mile Street and just move that beautiful heritage you know heritage house over there and then let the let the medical center do its thing there and, and maybe, maybe even expand a little bit because um, mm. is, well, that, is, that, is that possible? Because that, it, that, that would tick the boxes it seems because the critical issue is that is the heritage, the look of that house and it would, it would just be moving it, you know, a couple hundred, couple hundred meters. Yeah, well I, I don't think it would because um, that part of Mile Street is not part of the character area so it's actually the the Maple Street area that we're, we're trying to maintain mm -hmm. the character uh, along that street. So moving it, swapping it around is, is probably not consistent with, with the scheme. It would also mean the applicant starting again. That would be a fresh application, really, mm -hmm. uh, that would need to come from the applicant. So uh, we won't go into data for Monday, and I'll probably work with this here. I think it would be helpful to understand uh, the genesis of the, both the character area and why medical precincts uh, actually, well, medical stuff didn't actually set there. It was actually back in the late 80s, early 90s, where we had our first appeal against a removal of a character house and developed a development control plan. And part of the quid pro quo for retaining the character was to allow them to do, um, in my recollection, med uh, you know, create a medical precinct. The idea was the primary objective is retaining character, and one of the offsets is to allow them for commercial use, which, from memory, it was a, a a residential zone back then. Mm. Um, so to me, I think that's important. So if we can work together for Monday just to have a little bit of a mm -hmm. history about why that character, and I think you mentioned the report, you know, we've never approved the removal of a, a character house and that key linkage into the yeah. main of Croy. I think that's okay. probably good to have an understanding of Thanks, the long-standing nature of it. Yeah. Mm. Good. I'm sorry. Sorry to oh, Just one last. So with, with the, the weight of the heritage code, um, it, it, it's, it's obviously a lot of weight is put on that the heritage code in the, the new town plan. Whereas at, at the same time, um, the new town plan states that we are shooting for high economic yield, low impact sort of businesses um, in our in the uh, New Shire economic local economic plan. Mm -hmm. Number one is is health and wellness as far as where we want to go economically, you know, mm -hmm. with our businesses and so forth. So. It it, it, it it seems though if the policy of wanting to pr uh, promote the wellness industry, but the, the contrary is you don't want to change the, the look of Kuroi, and that's 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 the critical issue in this moving this house or you know destroying this house and moving it from that particular location mm -hmm. is what this is about, and you've you've gone with. I guess what the, the, the overall policy question I'm asking, you, you have the code here saying that you're not going to move the house, but you have this policy over here saying that we're shooting for um, high yield, low impact mm. businesses. Well, I think um, your question really goes to what Brian's uh, raising, mm -hmm. that there was that trade-off of looking at, you know, let's look at retaining the heritage to the character that Cora is known for. But the trade-off is rather than insist that it continue to be used for residential, let's allow it to be used for some medical. And typically, you do see a lot of older heritage Queenslanders used in that way. They convert mm -hmm. nicely to mm -hmm. sort of the different consulting rooms uh, for use by medical centres. So 
maybe through um, Brian's help we might be able to more fully answer your, your question. Mm. I think the other consideration there is that our, our character homes and our heritage assets are a finite resource. Whereas there are a, a, a range of opportunities for health and wellbeing uses to go into a range of buildings and facilities in, in, in all our business centres. So mm. there is a bit of a, a trade-off and I guess what you're talking about, Thomas, some competing policy objectives potentially, but it is about um, you know, looking at the fact that our heritage assets are um, getting more scarce. You know, and, and needing to protect those, and there yeah. are other opportunities for medical facilities to go in and around yeah. the centre in yeah. yeah. different locations. Because yeah. Corolla's business centre is it's quite a a, a large institution mm. centre, and there is actually a lot of land still to be developed in the business centre, um, where such a medical centre could go. Um, so this is not the last opportunity for them to cite such a proposal. Yeah. Where is that area? Yeah, we can provide a mapping, a map for you to show the area. Sure, that'd be great. Um, along the lines of what Councillor Wing is saying, um, with regards to the health and wellbeing and the precinct, I mean, the hospital is directly there. There is other health um, providers around the area. Um, how difficult would it be to um, change that sign or code or whatever on this block of land to become medical? And rather than looking at the heritage overlay as the primary thing, we focus on the health and wellbeing and the provision of those services in Karoi and look at options perhaps like moving that house to Pomona, which has been recognised as the heritage village and supporting that Point type order. of Parochialism. <laughs> <laughs> I understand and acknowledge heritage and the overlays. In that street, that building at the moment actually cannot be sighted from the street. The, the whole precinct there doesn't actually give the feel of heritage. Um, there's mixed business there. The buildings are not designed in a heritage type of manner, um, from my opinion. Um, and I would like to see the conversation move towards um, being more innovative in moving forward to be able to provide the Karoi Pomona, Karan and Kim Kim residents, the total 7,970 people in the last census, to access these services with our um, population um, of older couples and family in Karoi is 19%, established couples and families are at 16%, and elderly singles at 1105 down here at Nooseville on the census. Uh, just, uh, just, uh, you might be starting your debate which we're having on Monday. Have you got a question to start? Well, I have a question. How how difficult part, yeah. would it be yeah. to address the issue of provision of health care yeah. and be able to move the conversation away from heritage overlay? Well, I think that's a question we would really need to go back to our community on. Mm. Um, so. I understand the Minister Plan 2006 and the, the more recent plan, there was a lot of comments received from the community, at least in 2006, not sure about the more recent one, around protecting that heritage character. Um, so that's, that's, that's really a question I think that we would have to go back to our community on to say, you know, is this now the priority? Do we not yeah. want to protect these buildings? Is it okay to relocate them to Pomona or elsewhere? Mm. And do we actually want to see this area redeveloped? So, um, yeah. yeah. And okay. how does that community consultation process? I'll probably, yeah, probably answer that and answer that question as well. Ultimately, the answer to that lies in our planning scheme. So the adopted planning mm. scheme identifies this as a, a heritage character area. And so Kerry's job is then to implement or to assess the application against the council's adopted planning scheme. Mm -hmm. So. If you're going to want to go back and take away that heritage, it's, it's really a amendment to the planning scheme to do that. Yeah, okay. The other thing about heritage I've learned over the years is that heritage buildings are about context as well as the building themselves. So in other words, it's not just a building that um, may have heritage characteristics, but it's the context or locality that's, yeah. that's in. So you have a, a bunch of them together, it's more like a form of a precinct or a character precinct mm, yeah. than just one building in isolation amongst all the high rise or whatever it might be. It sort of loses that sense of mm. perspective. So that's why precincts tend to emerge yeah. and, and said, I, I can recall um, 
over the last couple of consultations on Pony Scan that seem to want people, they don't want to lose that look and feel and the Queensland vernacular of the, of the older buildings tends to come up a fair bit. Mm. So it is quite often a quite um, well-held view amongst the community, the need to protect the character of an area. Mm -hmm. um, but, but ultimately, one of the things you can do, and I've seen examples of this right across Queensland, Spring Hill's a good example of Brisbane where there's mm. a lot of heritage buildings that are used for medical purposes, mm. for mm. consultant rooms mm. and things like that. So the ideal is to get that duality with you, so the duality of purpose would be the, the best. Yeah. Mm. So, so what is the fundamental conflict you mentioned on page 29 associated with the proposed relocation of the existing character building? Is that because of this overlay in the precinct or is it just because of something with the applicant? So what's the, what, on the comment? On page 29? Yep. Okay. Um, to resolve the acceptable design outcome. This was not pursued with the applicant due to the fundamental uh -huh, yes. conflict associated with the proposed relocation of the existing character building. Yeah, so the the concept of exploring redesigning the proposed new building wasn't explored with the applicant because fundamentally we're not supportive of a new building being constructed on the site at officer level. We want to see the existing building retained. So we didn't we didn't want to say go and redesign that building because you still haven't got over that issue of not retaining the building. Yeah, the conflict is the scheme seeks to keep the building mm. yeah. and reuse it in its current location. Mm. Yeah. And this, this is a, a common, well, I think it might be one of the early ones, Ipswich City Council for sure in the 90s adopted this type of approach and my recollection was could demonstrate significant economic upgrades to their, their town centre result of their process of retaining character and food. Yeah, I think that probably well, I was involved in those. Yeah. Um, it was actually the top of town precinct was the first one in Queensland that was done and it did actually act as an economic driver um, to that. And I know I adopted it in the Gimpy city scheme, and, um, sorry, Gimpy Silver Guide <laughs> scheme in the 1990s and once again same thing, reuse of character and heritage buildings for special officers and medical. Once again, I think the, that proves over time that they have got a beneficial um, reuse opportunity. But that's something we're going to deal with on Monday. Is there any I other think, yeah, questions? questions. Yeah. Um, just on page 12, um, refuse the application for the following reasons. And there's the first four deal with, does not protect the heritage character building and provide it for adaptive reuse. Um, does not maintain or complement the traditional country streetscape, uh, does not provide a traditional roof which contributes positively to global skyline. Um, and so, so bearing in mind those reasons, and if you flip to page 23, um, it says a heritage impact assessment in March 2020 was provided in support of the application. Uh, these documents included assertions that the house has no heritage significance and has not been placed on the Noosa Council LHR. The character area has been already substantially eroded by prior contemporary redevelopment. Streetscape analysis supports removal. There is no longer a residential precinct and the removal of the house won't impact on the character values. So bearing in mind that that was an independent a heritage impact assessment and they were the outcomes, how do we then, the first three reasons, marry those reasons in relation to that, that independent assessment? That um, assessment was provided by the applicant. It was the applicant's consul yeah. consultant who, who made those conclusions. That was reviewed by our heritage officer at council um, who wasn't in, agree in agreement with those statements. Um, particularly, you know, all of those statements uh, didn't, wasn't supportive of any of them. Um, noted that whilst the house is not on a, the local heritage register, uh, it's still in a character precinct and they're two separate two separate things and, and the character precinct talks about streetscape, um, that the character hadn't been already eroded by contemporary development. There was no examples of, of recent um, development within that precinct. Uh, I think Eden Hospital is probably the only one on the opposite side of the road. And it was there a long time Has been there for a long it time. It occurred in the mid-80s. Um, yeah, but this a heritage impact assessment would have been done by a third party. I know provided for by the applicant, yep. but, but it's been done by it's, a third party. It's quite common for applicants to lodge reports by consultants, and then we will have an independent consultant who finds differently to it. So that, that happens you know, with traffic reports, environmental reports, 
Um, so if we if they've got one and we've got one, mm. do we ever go to a third then for a, for a, I mean for a third completely? We have an we have an internal officer who looked at it, but we also went to an external party um, who reviewed the report and was not supportive of the recommendations as well. What? Well, who was the external party? Um, Jane, we've got Jane Harden. Harding, Harding, Harding. 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 She's, She's our external. internal. The external is also a Jane. I'm sorry, her name will lose me at the moment. come back to yeah. you. Yeah. And just what, what, what company she's associated okay. with. Thank you. Yep. So it might also be good for Monday to have a little bit of an understanding of the difference between heritage and character. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. So obviously, as soon as a building's moved, you've lost any heritage. Um, mm -hmm. And what, what our um, officer and consultant are saying is that, that it, there's been no proper heritage assessment of the building as yet. But no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. yep. Who conducts the heritage assessment? So, um, and well, uh, there's heritage assessments around heritage architects that essentially make the assessment. So, our consultant would be qualified to do that, mm -hmm. um, as is their consultant um, would be qualified as well to make that heritage assessment. Um, but as I said, with all professionals, they can come up with different opinions. Mm. Um, but this is a character precinct. This is a character about precinct. Containing character. Yeah. So that's the essential item. Is we don't have to argue on heritage value. We have to argue on character assessment of yeah. about the, yeah. the scheme provision to retain the character of the streetscape. Yeah, that's right. This is about the streetscape, not individual buildings in the streetscape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're saying here the character area has already been substantially eroded. And I, I do know these streets, and there are contemporary buildings in that area. So um, this character was introduced in, well, in the DCP in the 90s, but also in 2006. There's been no new buildings built since 2006 in that area. So the existing hospital and those other buildings that are, that are a little bit at odds with the character were all there prior to council introducing this character area in 2006. Mm. So it hasn't eroded, there's been no change. Mm. That decision was made at the time um, in consultation with the community that this was an important street, important mm. character area and they wanted to keep it. With Notwithstanding there was some other buildings in the area. Yeah. With regards to the Eden Hospital, as you've mentioned, is there um, plans in or have been approved for extension of that hospital? And yes, there has been some plans in and approved by council officers. They're all to the rear of the building, to the laneway. Not a lot of change to the front of the building, or maybe to the side, but yeah, mostly to the rear of the building. So we will see new building taking yeah. place as part of that yep. approved development? Yeah, that's right. And when is that expected to begin? Uh, I don't know. I have to go back and ask the developer and the owners to know that. Okay. Okay. So, does someone want to move that the matter be referred to oh, well. Monday's meeting? Councillor Stewart, Councillor Wigner. We move on to item three. All those in favour, vote. Thank you. That was unanimous. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Item three is. <coughs> Regarding the planning environment appeal, Court Appeal D63 of 2020 refusal of a minor change to a development approval for a jetty at 60 the Peninsula Mooseville. And I have my first question. Um, I read in a public report advice from a solicitor about prospects. I would think that's a change to a long standing convention. And I'd like to know whether that was a deliberate decision, an oversight, or a result of the legislation changes that come into effect next week. Uh, probably number one and number three, a little decision on my part. Um, and part of it, when I look at this, I have to make a call about whether or not to make a report open or confidential. And I'd rather get into trouble for making it confidential than, or too many open than uh, too many confidential. So when in doubt, I always err on the side of open. In this particular case. Um, I thought it was appropriate that, uh, given it's not a, a, um, a major issue and seemed to be a fairly straightforward matter, I thought it was better that the report be made open. So there will be no, I obviously have long standing difference on the way you yep. handle it. But <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. It's a and thing. I, I agree that this is a minor issue, but in terms of um, showing your hand before a decision of council is made, if that was perceived as an appeal, I think it's a very risky one. Um, and so, in terms of legislative changes, 
is there, oh. like, no, you still the, have the general room. provision now related yeah. to planning schemes uh, has been removed, but... You still have under the, so um, just for information, on the 12th of October, there's new legislation coming in which impacts upon how councils run meetings and so on. One of the things, one of the changes in those uh, the legislation that's coming through is that the reasons for which a council can make a, or close a meeting to the public for confidential matters has, has been reduced. The number of reasons used to be quite a broad range of reasons, now that's been reduced. So one of the things that you used to be able to do was to deal with any planning application or any planning matter under the Act. Under the act. That's been removed, but there is still a provision about dealing with council's position in litigation, which is what this is. So the council still has the ability to um, make that call when it's dealing with litigations to have matters in confidence. Okay. And I'll hold it the floor. From recollection, this was one part of a series of non-compliance issues on this site. Um, I'm concerned that we now seem to be having uh, more regular than previously incidents where people disregard regulation or disregard staff direction, wait to appeal and then hope that it goes in their favour. Um, recently we had one where a privately certified extension was built over the top of the a waterway marked on the planning scheme only to find an appeal that we were told our prospects were low because it was already there. Um, from Which was that one? Me. Me Me straight. Straight. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> How could I forget? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> are there any other compliance options to prosecute people who are developing without appropriate approval or contrary to approval? Is there options for us to have a more overt policy of stop work or some mechanism to put to the market that this trend has to stop? Because as a council, I quite often get complaints and we're hamstrung because they're privately certified until the private certified has said the building's finished, even though, you know, in one recent case, uh, the, the builder without approval started building his works on the neighbour's property. Um, it's it's a a growing problem, I believe, as a result of the experiment, which was to private put uh, regulatory compliance out into the private market. So, mm. in this particular case, and more generally, um, how do I answer that question? <laughs> so, council officers regularly review building approvals issued by certifiers. Um, now, at times of high workload, uh, we aren't able always to review them. So, the intent there is to try and um, make sure the approvals issued by certifiers are consistent with the planning scheme and we also catch them at a stage prior to commencing works on site which is always easier to fix than after the fact if they start commencing work. So we do have that practice to try and address those issues early. Um, our, the other tools we have available is uh, in the last few years we've introduced infringement notices to find people for non-compliance um, with the planning scheme. Now we've only introduced that so far as finding people for clearing vegetation without approval. Um, but there are, that could be extended if council wished to explore that. Um, so there is the opportunity to find for other non-compliances. Um, otherwise there's only the traditional methods of issuing notices and seeking those people to either remove it or they always have the option of lodging an application. Now. In history, yes, a lot of those retrospective approvals do get approval, or retrospective applications do get approval, but there's also a number where they're actually made to modify it before they can gain approval. So um, it's never desirable, um, and happy to hear from councillors around any thoughts on that. I certainly think that was at least a report or a workshop looking at what our options are in the future, because as I said, my gut feeling is that it's become an increasing problem and I think we need to send clear messages that yep. uh, we have high standards in this and we want to maintain it. Yep. I think over the last five years I've probably seen more requests for forgiveness and applications for approval. You know, that yeah. trend is coming up where people have yeah. put something in and then they're seeking retrospective approval. Um, and that puts council in a difficult position because often there's a building there or whatever and it's much more difficult 
scenario to say no when something's already in place. So mm. it is a, it's a problem, and it's not just an Uber problem, by the way. It's coming mm. other places. It's a problem. It seems um, as that the problem will grow in Noosa as real estate prices rise and as the, the, the competition for the limited space increases. The, uh, the incentive for people to do exactly that, to start building and then to ask for forgiveness later, grows. Mm -hmm. as it's just, it's a, it's a problem of being really successful in Nusa yeah. with, with creating really high value real estate. Is yeah. that right? Is yeah, that... I think you're right, Tom. I, th I think as land prices rise, there's going to be increasing pressure um, for you know developers proceeding without their appropriate approval or seeking approval for matters that are contrary to the planning scheme also. So I think that's why we're perhaps seeing that trend a little bit as you know, prices and land value to continue to increase. But in this regard, we're just looking, um, and I think this has always been my view on the matter, that we're just looking at a very, very minor thing. I mean, it says here, um, the design reflects the design of the residential property which it adjoins it and it just concerns one white timber jetty's handrail with Chris infill design. Yep. I mean, it's a very minor yeah, issue. Yeah, it might seem minor, and it is. The handrail is minor in the scheme yeah. of things. But um, there is a consistent practice of asking for a particular handrail to ensure they all match along, along the, um, the waterway. So I, I think I provided something. at the time in the council meeting a lot of photos because I know yep. a lot. And there is, with all due respect, when you go along there, there's, there's no consistent, they all look very different and there's a lot of, um, you know, ones that, you know, look or, you know, out of place that aren't, are very run down, aren't taken care. So I, I would suggest that there is no consistent use when you look at, when you get on the water and actually look yeah. at all of them in, in alignment. And in fact, this one, this house is probably most aesthetically, as I said at the time, pleasing out of any and the one that actually aligns the most with the house itself. Yeah. I mean, there's so much argy bargy out there mm. that you know. This to me was probably it comes back to a little bit of what Councillor Stockwell raised. Is you'd find a lot of those that are not not consistent are probably being built without an mm. approval. I think that's one of the issues that's in that particular neighbourhood is the residents' association has always raised with council about trying to keep the call it the look and feel of the waterways as uncluttered as possible mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, that's always been their, mm -hmm. their approach and I think the council's tried to support that as much as we can. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, and that sort of comes back to me in terms of, this is a, an internally focused issue, it's not a public interest, although I do, do occasionally take the scouts for a paddle there at night time to annoy the residents. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is something that if, it want, if we were to change a, a position on it, it'd be something that we probably could talk to the Residents Association and get a, a community view on because mm -hmm. you say it yeah. may be that times change and, yeah. and views change. But yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the neighbours of this property, I, I got emails and the, the people in the street were very supportive of, of this of the handrail, incredibly. Yeah. I know the, the, the Noosa Residents Waters Association may not have been, but the people who were directly impacted were incredibly supportive of yeah. this house yeah. and this design. Yeah. Well, it's something that I've raised with strategic planning to have a look at, whether we want to continue with officers' practice or we mm. um, allow something a little bit different in the other way. Good overall question. So we have um, specific outcome 011 of the Water Courses Works Code. So that, that's a code and it, it says the, um, the railings are supposed to be a certain way, but here it says we, we actually, that code is not strong enough to support an appeal like this. That's right. But that in so is there a variation of strength of codes because you have the heritage code in Koroi in the previous case, which is strong enough to, you know, support an appeal. So is there a ranking of codes or is it the, the clarity of the writing or how do we how do we rate the strength of a particular rule? Yeah. Well it's about how clear the words are articulated in the code. It's not comparing codes much each other, just in this particular instance, there's, there's very little wording around the requirement for the handrail and what they should look at, whereas the heritage overlay has quite clear requirements about retaining um, the existing buildings in those character areas. So the words just aren't there in the overlay code to insist on ensuring a simple designed hand, handrail. Any more questions? If not, I'll move the recommendation. I'll second it. 
All those in favour? And that brings us to the end of the meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.